So uh, thank you, Dr. Hassan, for your kind invitation. Um, I'm delighted to talk about advancements in neurovascular surgery as it pertains to aneurysm treatment. Uh, I'm uh, uh, Dr. Stav Dumacaris uh, from Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia, where I'm a professor of neurosurgery and uh, the first dual trained female to be doing this uh, in the United States. So uh, these are my disclosures as they pertain to the lecture. And uh, this is Thomas Jefferson University in uh, Philadelphia, where we have a dedicated uh, neuroscience hospital, uh, the Vicky and Jack Farber Institute. Um, this is the conventional operating room, as uh, we know it, where we clip aneurysms. And this uh, um, we have been doing for the last uh, uh, 50 years. And this is the new operating room, the uh, minimally invasive cerebrovascular endovascular suite where we can do minimally invasive cases or join cases with uh, open microsurgical technique. Uh, this is our hospital, uh, again, the Vicky and Jack Farber Neuroscience Institute. And this is the tri-state area where uh, our catchment area in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware. Uh, we have uh, a team of uh, dual trained neurosurgeons, uh, stroke neurologists, and critical care intensivists that uh, uh, we jointly take care of all these patients. So I'm going to start by, um, as you know, from my name, I'm actually a neighbor, I'm Greek. Uh, anevrisma is the original term uh, of aneurysm, and it means uh, to widen within. Um, and this is the evolution of endovascular neurosurgery. We started back in the uh, mid-1990s with coiling embolization, um, then liquid embolic agents, and then in the early 2010 uh, decade, flow diversion with a pipeline device uh, uh, revolution as the way we treat aneurysms, and now we're looking into intracycular devices. Um, this was a disruptive uh, inno innovation uh, uh, device. Um, can you see me? Yes, yes, we can. Right. And uh, this is the typical flow diversion device, which is uh, three times the uh, lack of porosity as opposed to the conventional stenting. And uh, that was enough to occlude the aneurysm without having to go inside the aneurysm. Currently, the FDA-approved uh, devices in the USA are uh, the pipeline device uh, as of 2011. And uh, most recently, we have the surpass device and the front devices. These are linear flow diversion devices. So in other words, bypassing the aneurysm. And now we have an endocycular device that you'll see the web device. So the first on-label indication limited the treatment of aneurysms uh, from uh, the petrous carotid all the way to the superior hypophyseal. So a uh, very limited portion. And these were some of the original cases that we did. Uh, this is a cavernous aneurysm treated in six months complete aneurysm obliteration. Uh, similar with this uh, uh, large cavernous symptomatic aneurysm. If you look at this aneurysm, this is an intradural thalmic artery aneurysm. Uh, you see that it has four distinct lobes. Uh, for those of us who also practice open surgery, this is a challenging aneurysm to take care of. Um, you have to drill the clinoid and you will need multiple clip reconstruction. And you see here that the ophthalmic artery comes off of the ophthalmic uh, aneurysm itself. So potentially leaving a little remnant behind to uh, maintain patency of the artery. Uh, with a single stent, as you see here, you have complete reconstitution of the vessel and aneurysm occlusion in five minutes. Um, there are some things that we learned from, uh, uh, from us performing these procedures. And one of them is the process of using the artery is fetal. Uh, in, in our series, 100% of the patients did not have aneurysm occlusion when treated with flow diversion. And this is an example. So once we see a fetal pecum artery, we don't bother flow diverting anymore. This uh, case needs to be treated with microsurgery and clipping. Um, in 2019, following a plethora of... Uh, um, uh, different publications, the pipeline um, from the FDA to now cover from the Petra segment all the way to the carotid terminus segment. Um, we actually did in my institution, the first pipeline flex device uh, for comm commercial use. And obviously we expanded our indications and published on this. Uh, this is a patient, as you see, he has a, a left pica artery aneurysm at the fourth segment. You can see here, there's a Murphy's excrescence um, within the aneurysm and partially the aneurysm is fusiform. 
So um, this kind of aneurysm would require a pica to pica bypass and completely obliterate the aneurysm from the circulation. However, uh, this is with a single stent device. Uh, you can see here the deployment of the device. Uh, the aneurysm is completely gone. As you see here, one month follow-up and uh, uh, the artery has reconstituted. How about giant aneurysms? This is a 56-year-old male that presented with left-sided hemiparesis. You can see this giant partially thrombosed aneurysm almost behaving like a tumor uh, with associated posterior MCA edema. And uh, this is a very challenging case to treat it open. You actually have to use the treatment device to remove some of the thrombus. Um, and then once you're closer to the aneurysm and a lot of the thrombus is uh, removed, then you can put the truck. It's a very prolonged case. Uh, however, uh, this is the angiogram as you see. This is a distal M1 artery aneurysm, which gave us the uh, uh, capacity to land a single stent. This is a three-dimensional reconstruction. And you can see uh, in six months follow-up, complete reconstitution of the vessel, a removal of the mass effect in the patient did very well postoperatively. How about the challenging cases, such as a, a, an unruptured AVM uh, in the left occipital region? And you can see here these high-risk for rupture inflow aneurysms. There are three of them um, uh, in the proximal P1 and the distal basal or apex. Again, these are very challenging cases to treat uh, with open surgery, not just because of location, but also because of the associated distal AVM. Um, this is a single device. This is a flow divergent stent. And this is a six month follow-up where you can see complete reconstitution of the endothelium, no filling of the aneurysms. And then the uh, patient underwent embolization of the AVM followed by microsurgery. Um, how about these complex uh, cases? This is a fenestrated basilar aneurysm. We've actually published our experience with fenestrations. These are very challenging cases uh, to treat with open surgery. And uh, what we discovered is the way to treat this is to actually coil partially the aneurysm and then a flow divert the dominant limb and deconstruct. In other words, shut down the non-dominant limb to prevent that inflow and patency of the aneurysm. And uh, this is what you see here on the bottom right picture, 100% uh, aneurysm occlusion and six month follow up. Then we get some complicated cases such as this uh, uh, broken construct that we got from another institution. You can see here if uh, inexperienced surgeons do these procedures, sometimes the construct can actually break. Uh, so uh, we were able to cross the construct and put a bridging device and prevent this uh, inflow endo leak that could lead to a catastrophic rupture. Uh, some of the lessons that uh, were learned, this is a very good paper that was published by Dr. Myers and his group. Uh, you, even if uh, the aneurysm is in a non-intradural uh, segment, such as cavernous aneurysms, you can still have a rupture and develop a carotid cavernous fistula, <clears throat> and that can be treated with complete aneurysm occlusion and embolization. Um, the device can migrate, as I showed you earlier, in another transfer. And this is a giant aneurysm where the device migrated into the aneurysm dome. So when you're dealing with giant aneurysms, you need to use very uh, large and uh, long construct to prevent that accordion of the device into the apex of the aneurysm. Um, uh, so if aneurysms are intradural and greater than one centimeter, so the recommendation currently is to coil assist these aneurysms to prevent this delayed rupture. Patients that have other uh, hematological disorders, such as the sickle cell patient, uh, you can see in six month follow up, there was a, a ruptured posterior carotid wall artery aneurysm that was successfully treated. The aneurysm is gone. There's some mild instant stenosis, but the patients that have sickle cell or other uh, uh, high thrombotic uh, disorders can, during a crisis such as a sickle cell crisis, the clumps of the sickle cells can actually increase the stenosis and uh, put the patient at a high risk for stroke. So these patients need to be kept on dual antiplatelet therapy for longer, aspirin and Plavix, and a very prompt exchange transfusion. You can see here pre and post transfusion uh, resolution of the severe stenosis. Um, the, the current uh, devices, uh, the new generation devices, um, actually have a modification of the wall of the stent uh, that mimics the red blood cells and decrease the, the, decreases the thrombogenicity of the stent. And uh, we're hoping that uh, in the future, you will not need to use dual antiplatelet therapy uh, for these devices. Um, and this is uh, the pipeline shield was the first one that has this new surface modification technology. 
And these are the upcoming trials for the pipeline shield and the FredX device from Microvention. And there's an upcoming uh, FredX trial uh, that I will be the national PI for investigating this new um, uh, concept. So in 2019, um, the FRED device, which is slightly different, became FDA approved. Um, and again, the same location, Petrus to carotid terminus artery aneurysm. What's very special about this device, there's part of the stent that doesn't flow divert. In other words, it works like an anchor and it allows you to position it to uh, bifurcation aneurysms without jailing that aneurysm. Um, uh, my group did uh, the first uh, FRED uh, device following FDA approval. Um, and uh, this is an example of the FRED device from the original trial. You can see a PECOM artery aneurysm recurrence that was treated with 100% six month follow up. This is the actual deployment of the device. Um, you can see here that it conformed very nicely here to the paraclinoid aneurysm. And this is what I was mentioning earlier part of the device doesn't flow divert. So you can land it distally without jailing, for example, the A1 in the carotid terminus aneurysm. Uh, these are some of the uh, cases that we've done with this new technology. This is an ophthalmic artery aneurysm. In the middle, you see the famous eclipse sign in linear flow diversion. What it means is following stent deployment, you see the stasis and half the aneurysm is completely gone. That's a very good prognostic indicator for complete aneurysm occlusion, as you see here in six month follow-up. Uh, these are some more challenging cases. For example, this complex trilobe PECOM artery aneurysm recurrence following a rupture. You can see here with a single FRED device placement, reconstitution of the aneurysm, and some of the uh, uh, stenosis within the stent as time goes on, you can see that uh, the vessel reconstitute and uh, the flow within the stent improves as well. Uh, this is another example of uh, two ophthalmic artery aneurysms that were treated. And again, my, my point with this device is the non-flow diverting segment allows you to actually deploy the distal in the carotid terminus or in a basilar terminus, obviating the need of uh, jailing one of the other branches. And this is a, a superior hypophyseal artery aneurysm. You can see here deployment of the stent, a very sturdy deployment. And you'll see how the part that doesn't flow divert will go distal and not cause any trouble with the A1 segment of the intracerebral artery. Um, this is a, a, a very resheathable device. So when we train fellows, we're actually um, have a lot of opportunities to be able to really be precise about the deployment. Um, this is, and you can treat very complex aneurysms. You can see here this complex case with a fusiform MCA that failed the previous clip uh, that came for a second opinion for flow diversion. And we built uh, a construct of these stents within the aneurysm. You can see here five stent construct. And uh, on um, a follow up angiogram, you can see almost complete. Uh, stasis within the aneurysm and aneurysm occlusion without uh, the need of uh, repeat surgery and bypass in that area. Um, what's the latest device? Uh, in flow diversion, we have junior devices. In other words, very, very small vessels. Uh, this is a pericolosal artery aneurysm that had a rupture, was coiled, presented with a 30% recurrence at the neck. And uh, with a single device, we were able to treat the recurrence successfully. Uh, the latest in flow diversion is actually endosacular flow diversion. And uh, the device that we have that's FDA approved in the United States is the web device. And as you see here, it's flow diverting within the aneurysm. So the basket gets deployed a single device as opposed to multiple coils within the aneurysm. And then in time that causes aneurysm occlusion. These are our cases for um, uh, the trial, uh, the web uh, IT trial that established safety and efficacy of the device. And this is FDA approved for bifurcation aneurysm. So this is an ACOM artery aneurysm. You can see here down in the bottom right, uh, one year follow up 100% aneurysm occlusion. And this is how the device looks uh, angiographically. Uh, similarly, an MCA artery aneurysm, you can see you can have irregular aneurysms and uh, complete aneurysm occlusion without open surgery at six month follow up. Another uh, right middle server artery, one centimeter aneurysm with complete aneurysm occlusion. So again, the indications are bifurcation artery aneurysms. This has been FDA approved for nearly uh, three years now. 
And uh, one of the reasons I really like this device, and this is our uh, paper that we published on this, is actually the treatment of ruptured aneurysms. So if you have a ruptured aneurysm with a wide neck, almost always these cases need to uh, undergo microsurgery or clipping. Uh, because if you use a stent, then you will have to use dual antiplatelet therapy, aspirin and Plavix, which increases the risk of perioperative hemorrhage. However, um, when you use the web device, you don't need the second agent, just aspirin or no aspirin alone. And uh, you can see here, this is uh, one of my patients presented with a Hunt has grade four subarachnoid hemorrhage. You can see mainly um, in the posterior circulation and uh, this wide neck irregular vascular apex artery aneurysm. With a single device, you can see here on the right, complete aneurysm occlusion. This is not a six month follow up, it's completely following the deployment of the device. When it's sized properly, you can uh, achieve 100% uh, obliteration immediately. And the only remnant of uh, treatment is really this dose, the two poles of the device at the proximal and distal end of the aneurysm. Uh, this is another case I treated a ruptured basilar apex artery aneurysm. You can see here the space is within the aneurysm. Uh, that's a good prognostic sign that the aneurysm will be gone at six month follow up, and also that you, you've sized the device properly. Now uh, we can even treat more complex cases. This is a ruptured anterior communicator artery aneurysm. You can see here a very wide neck um, with uh, 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 Murphy's excrescence here uh, laterally, and uh, with a single device aneurysm occlusion, as you see here on the right. This is again immediately after deployment, not having to wait for six months. Uh, this is another case, an M1 artery aneurysm <clears throat> treated with uh, a single web device as well. Uh, this uh, a stasis within the basket, and it's a, a very good prognostic indicator for complete aneurysm occlusion. And on the table, we can get uh, Dyna CT to see the exact position of the, of the device with the different bifurcation branches. And uh, we've expanded the indication to very complex cases. This is a bilobed ACOM aneurysm in an 80 year old male with a rupture. And uh, this is the actual aneurysm. You can see here 180 degree uh, orientation of the two different necks. And we deployed two different devices. Here's, here's a Dynasty T following the deployment almost at 90 degree angle with each other. And you can see here nice stasis within the aneurysm. <clears throat> And this 80 year old gentleman didn't have to undergo open surgery at uh, this advanced age. Uh, we have uh, pushed the envelope again. This is uh, uh, treating sidewall aneurysm. So you really need to get comfortable with the device before you increase increasing the complexity. And this is an off label usage, but uh, uh, this causes a nice result. You can see here without needing a clip on a fetal pecum vessel, we cannot treat it minimally invasive, especially in patients that are of advanced age. This is another sidewall aneurysm. This is a ruptured ophthalmic artery aneurysm. Uh, you can see here it's treated with a single device. And uh, this is uh, uh, the native where you can see the uh, device here in the ophthalmic region. The patient actually had a basilar apex at the same time treated with another device. And this is a uh, nice stasis. You can see preservation of the ophthalmic artery and uh, the patient's uh, protected from subarachnoid hemorrhage. Now, if the... Uh, uh, aneurysm morphology is complex such as this one, you don't have to fill the entire basket uh, with the aneurysm. As you see here, for example, this Murphy's excrescence, the point of rupture uh, is treated by secondary intent. So you block the inflow. So a lot of times you're sizing the aneurysm based on the neck and not just the entire width of the aneurysm. What's the latest with endosecular devices? This is the Web 17 device that is a very small device. And this is an M4 uh, level um, uh, MCA aneurysm. And you can see with a single device, complete aneurysm occlusion. And you can see here treatment of the Murphy's excrescence with a secondary intent by blocking it from the circulation uh, with the device proximally. Uh, currently we have an FDA approved uh, clinical trial that we're rolling a brand new device that came from Europe, the Contour. And uh, this is my first case. Um, and this is treatment uh, of a recurrence of a web device. So you're treating shallow aneurysms. The contour device is a little bit different. It doesn't have half of the dome of the web device. So it will allow you to treat, for example, this wide neck recurrence uh, without having to use a very large device. So there's a lot of new technology coming out. And uh, one of the best new technologies that I'm gonna leave you with is robotics in neuroendovascular surgery. 
Um, this is the current robot that's uh, approved both in Europe in uh, January 2018 and also in America with the FDA. Currently, just for peripheral vascular lesions, it's called Corindus. Um, and we have the second generation device here. So only for peripheral vascular, which means uh, carotid stenting, we now do robotically. Um, you require two teams. One team is at the bedside doing the actual placement of the sheath. And one team uh, does the robotic uh, drive of uh, all the devices remotely and not present at the bedside. So this is a transfemoral um, positioning of a carotid stent. And you can see this is me here in the operating room, however, in an adjacent room. So I'm not exposing myself to the radiation and I'm able to uh, uh, drive these devices without having to be at the bedside. This could be revolutionary and we could be doing these uh, procedures remotely um, uh, perhaps several thousand miles uh, uh, away from the patient. The advantages, again, increases precision of uh, manipulating the microcatheters and the microwire, reducing or minimizing completely radiation exposure of the physician, and again, allowing for remote intervention, so perhaps being able to treat stroke or aneurysms uh, in underserved areas. Well, this has already happened in the cardiac world. This is uh, Dr. Patel in India. He completed five procedures 20 miles away uh, using the uh, Corpath uh, robot. <clears throat> and uh, this is the most exciting uh, uh, part of this treatment of intracranial diseases. And this is in Toronto, Dr. Pereira and his group. Um, they don't have the FDA restrictions. So they were able to be the first to treat an intracerebral aneurysm with robotics. So this is a, a superior cerebral artery aneurysm treated with a stent-assisted coiling, completely robotic from beginning to end. Uh, and the patient had a great follow-up and complete aneurysm occlusion. So although we're not there yet, uh, the FDA, um, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, uh, core path has applied for FDA approval for intracranial lesions, such as cerebral aneurysms, AVMs, and strokes, and uh, hopefully pending approval. So we're able to use this new technology and treat aneurysms uh, remotely. Uh, we'll leave you with that. Thank you again for your kind invitation. And uh, uh, it's a pleasure being here today. Thank you so much, Madam, for the excellent talk. And again, it's a, it's a matter of huge honor for us to have you here and to have the privilege of listening to your wonderful lecture and all the wonderful views you have shared, especially regarding robotics, which is going to be a very important topic in the near future. And there's a lot of research going on. Madam, thank you so much for sharing the your wonderful talk. Um, again, um, I don't think uh, I'm, uh, there will might be questions for you in the chat section. Again, thank you so much for allocating and sparing your time while you were about to get your flight today so thank you so much <laughs> it's my pleasure i'm glad it worked out and i was able yeah. to give it live have a have a philly cheesesteak for me please oh i will i sure will john <laughs> when i get to philly I'll, I'll grab one for you thank you thank you so much uh thank you dr hassan for having me <laughs>